nature of metrical concepts such as those of a day, a month, a minute, etc. Both tests seek something more akin to Williams' total definition, account of what time that large-scale feature of the universe is. So I want to say a few things about his understanding of Aristotle's definition first, and then discuss why he thinks it's adequate. And I hope I have time to at least get to, to his basic theory. There are a lot of um, interest, intricacies involved in this material, which I won't be able to get to. Uh, although scholars still debate the meaning of Aristotle's definition of time as a number of change with respect to before and after, Grossetest thinks the basic idea, and perhaps not the details, is one we are all well aware of. Aristotle writes in his definition by noting the relation of time to change, and this is in the first part of this, which... Uh, oh. All in your fingers. Okay, it's in these first two paragraphs he explains this. Um, uh, as Grossetest explains, Aristotle, time and change are conceptually inseparable. The thought of one is accompanied by the thought of the other. Such properties of change as divisibility, continuity, and before and after derive Aristotle claims from the space over which the change occurs, and time in turn derives these properties from change. Thus, Aristotle concludes that there must be an oblique reference to change in the definition of time. Time is something of change, aliquid motus. From such considerations, Aristotle arrives at his definition of time as a number of change in respect of before and after. But does Aristotle even demonstrate, in this technical sense of providing a proof meeting very strict conditions, a definition of time. Grossetest thinks not. Instead, he takes Aristotle simply to give an account of what the word time ordinarily means, or perhaps better, of one of the things the word ordinarily means. And Aristotle unfolds the meaning of this word in what Grossetest calls a lewis confabulatio, an informal conversational manner. After all, Grossetest writes, all those who hear this name time ah, do, but they've got to, uh, oh, that's it. You have to see, I was thinking you have to push this way to get it. But it's no, backwards. Okay, it's backwards. It's a Windows computer. That's the problem. Um, uh, uh, after all, gross test writes, I quote, all those who hear this name time understand at once that what's named by time, whatever it may be, is indeed a measure of change in respect of before and after. Moreover, Grosetest points out, Augustine, while well aware that time is a measure of change, still looked for its essence. He didn't know the essence of time, Grosetest writes, and yet he knew that time, whatever it may be, is related to change as a measure to what is measured by it. That Aristotle is not concerned to provide an account of the essential nature of time is no surprise, Grosetest thinks, the physics is essentially concerned the study of change, so it's perfectly natural for Aristotle to focus on time's relation to change, and in particular on time in the sense in which it's a measure of change. Thus, later in the text, and I'm not trying to find it, well, I'm getting completely lost, Grosdes remarks, uh, it is perhaps not the concern of the student of nature to determine about time in respect of its essential definition but only in respect of its relations to change and changeable things. But why, we may ask, isn't the essential nature of time to be a measure of change? To answer this question, let's consider in a little more detail Grosetest's understanding of Aristotle's definition. Certainly Aristotle considers time to be a measure of change, but it is a measure of a special kind, a number. To explain the sort of measure described as a number, Gross test turns to the measurement of bodies, since he sees a strict parallel between the numerical measurement of bodies and the numerical measurement of change. He writes, well, here we go, it's that passage there. Yeah. Uh, he writes, time is called the number of change in the way rational lines and rational magnitudes are called numbers of the bodies that the magnitudes measure in respect of numbered and positive measures. Thus, a one-cubit or two-cubit long line is called a number, 
that is numbered and measured out in respect of a posited measure of a line. In this way, change is numbered and measured in respect of measures posited in time. This concept of a rational line of magnitude is drawn from Book 10 of Euclid's Elements, and in one of the manuscripts of the physics commentary, it's explained thus in a passage attributed to Boethius' now lost geometry. Uh, the line goes, a rational line is a line characterized in terms of some number in respect of one of the named measures, namely, for example, in respect of the digit, inch, and palm. In other words, a rational line is a line as it's characterized in terms of n units, where n is some number greater than or equal to 1. Uh, leaving aside questions of fractional um, uh, characterization here. And the unit is a conventionally established or positive unit of length. So, for example, uh, a two cubit line, long line is a rational line. It's a line characterized in terms of two unit measures of a cubit. And thus, it is a number in the sense of issue. This is what is meant by a number in this material, and it may be used to measure bodies. Gross test notes, however, a need for care here. Although we ordinarily talk of measuring bodies and of doing so by means of bodies, for example, I measure a piece of wood uh, using by means of a wooden ruler, uh, in actual fact, we measure the magnitudes of bodies and we do so by means of magnitudes conventionally established as units of measurement. We take a body and specify its magnitude as a unit of measure. And I think a cubit is from here to here, right? Take that, that, that magnitude is a cubit, and then we can measure the magnitude of other bodies in terms of it. One. Okay, two cubits long to here. That's the idea. But what I'm measuring is not the wood, it's the size or magnitude of the wood. Thus, we measure the, measure the magnitude of a piece of wood by means of the magnitude of the wooden ruler. Gross test applies this account directly to Aristotle's account of time. An n cubit long line is a number of a body in the sense that it's a linear magnitude characterized in terms of n units of conventionally established unit of length, the cubit. In the same way, time is a number of change in the sense that it's the magnitude of change in respect of before and after as characterized in terms of n units of a conventionally established unit of such magnitude, for example, a day or a minute. This magnitude of change is what we would now call as duration. Thus, time for Aristotle uh, where are we? I've lost my place. Um, hang on. Thus, time for Aristotle is the numerically characterized magnitude or duration of change. And in fact, a little later in the text, Gross Test makes a slight modification and holds that he means that time is not the numerically characterized, necessarily, but characterized at all magnitude of change, for otherwise we will have to say time exists only when duration is actually numerically characterized by the mind, uh, which in fact was a view that Averroes was to adopt um, but, uh, in work with Gross Test at this point, I think, does not know of. Um, I'm not sure it might not have been written at this point. Um, so we're now in a position to consider why he finds this account unsatisfactory as an account of the true essence of time. I think there are actually a number of um, reasons for his dissatisfaction, but I want to focus here on two that have assumed particular importance in accounts of time. So shortcomings of Aristotle's account. Uh, Aristotle's definition of time is the numerically characterizable duration of change, which would probably be more accurate to describe it as um, not talking about time as such, but of a period of time, a definition of what a period of time is, um, what a day, what two days, what this kind of talk is about, and what uh, he's capturing in effect, Aristotle, what uh, in his uh, abstract terms, the partial metrical conception of time mentioned by Cicero. He's telling us what a time is. 
um, in the sense of what sort of thing is a day or a week or a minute. So understood, his concern is not the one you're likely to have if you ask Augustine's famous question, what is time? Uh, in asking this, we're not normally asking, what sort of thing is a day or a week? We're instead asking about the nature of a certain large-scale feature of our experience and the universe. Now, time, as we experience it, seems to have two peculiar features. In the first place, it seems to flow, with the future becoming present, the present becoming past, and the past becoming ever more past. But nothing in Aristotle's account speaks to this idea. As Norman Kretzmann remarked, Aristotle presents his own de definition of time in terms of temporal statics as the measurable dimension of motion in respect of earlier and later. Secondly, the present seems to differ in its ontological status from the past and future. The present seems to be real, whereas the past and future seem to be two kinds of unreality. Again, nothing in Aristotle's account of time speaks to this apparent feature of time. Moreover, these two apparent features of time appear to be intimately connected. The flow of time, it might be thought, consists in the fact that the existing present falls continuously into non-existent and the non-existent future comes into existence. This at least is how time appears to us. Now, of course, appearance may not correspond to reality. The majority of contemporary philosophers of time take these apparent features of time to be an illusion, artifacts of the way we experience time and events given our psychology and location in the time series, but not themselves objective features of reality at all. According to these philosophers, the past and future are no less real than the present, and there is no such thing as objective time flow. The majority of medieval thinkers, in contrast, take the flow of time and the unreality of the past and future to be objective features of reality. Now, I think Grossetest, too, holds this view. And so an account of the true essence of time must find a place for the flow of time and for the ontological difference between the present on the one hand and the past and future on the other. And these, I suggest, are two reasons, key reasons, why Grossetest thinks that Aristotle does not propose an account of the true essence of time. Aristotle's account being concerned with the purely metrical notion of a period of time as a numerical measure of change simply does not touch on these fundamental features of time. His accounts seem perfectly compatible with rejection of temporal flow and acceptance of the reality of the past and future. It doesn't capture what's special about time since it focuses on what time has in common with measures of spatial magnitude not on what differentiates time from space. Now, uh, it's notoriously hard to explain the flow of time as an objective feature of reality, and uh, many there are proponents of objective time flow amongst philosophers, although they're the minority, and many think that this is, or something related to it, has to be a primitive concept um, uh, that cannot be fully explicated, uh, sui generis, as it were. And it's noteworthy that Grosseteste himself, when he considers the essential nature of time, does not claim to provide a definition of time or to fully account for its true essence. Instead, he speaks of, I quote, touching on more closely the essence of time. Even so, we can, he thinks, throw some light on time's essence. The key is to see how time is related to eternity. In explicating time in terms of eternity, I propose, Gross test hopes to capture, however inadequately, the flow of time and the special nature of the present as the totality of temporal reality. So let's just move this to where we get um, the key passages here. Now, there was, of course, precedent for thinking of uh, time and eternity, very an intimate relation. In the Timaeus, 
Um, one of the very few works of Plato available to the Latin West. Plato defines time as the moving image of eternity, and this Platonic conception is echoed in Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy in the poem of Qui Perpetua, where Boethius writes in one line of the poem, uh, O you God who governs the world by everlasting reason, creator of lands and sky, who commands time to go from the Iwum. Now this term Iwum is later employed by medieval authors to refer to the special mode of being of angels intermediate between God's timeless eternity and time, but in Boethius it's used here to refer to God's um, timeless eternity. Later in the constellation, Boethius repeats the Platonic conception of time, writing of how the infinite movement of temporal things imitates the presence of God's motion, motionless life, and of how the motionless presence of eternity bestows on what it touches the appearance of being. Uh, at root, this Platonic conception of time is, is a conception of the nature of uh, temporal existence, and Grosseteste proposes what I think is essentially a version of this line of thought, though somewhat more developed than we find in either Plato or Boethius. And I want to just present the basic picture now, and I will finish up with doing that and reserve all the difficulties it raises mm -hmm. uh, for some other time. So he begins his account of time by quoting Boethius' famous definition of eternity in Book 5 of the Constellation of Philosophy as the complete possession of life, um, uh, the, of the whole of life at once. And he goes on to write, okay, I keep hitting the wrong thing. Um, this at once, the Seymour, doesn't refer to an at once in time or in an instant because it is before an instant and before time. And he writes, I place an at once of this sort above the totality of existence, and as this once at once is placed over the totality of uncreated existence, it is first eternity, by which he means God's eternity, while placed over the totality of created existence, it is second eternity, the sort of eternity the angelic substances have, for they are eternal inasmuch as they adhere to the first uncreated existence itself and through adherence to it partake in the totality of their existence of the at once of the uncreated existence itself to which they adhere. So according to Grosseteste, Boethius' definition of eternity applies to timeless beings, beings that have the whole of their existence at once and these beings have no temporal spread to their existence. There is no before and after, temporal before and after in their existence. What distinguishes God's eternity, first eternity, from second eternity, the angel's eternity, is that what exists in second eternity has this relation of adhering to God and of partaking in doing so in the totality of uh, its existence of this at once a symbol of God. So the idea is that the angel is in a relationship where its whole existence stands in this relationship of adhering to the at once of God's eternity. Um, and in this respect, an angel is very different from a temporal being, and it's this difference that is key to Grosseteste's account of time. A temporal being partakes of the at once of eternity, but only ever does so in respect of part of its existence, never the whole. Thus, Grosseteste explains time in terms of the totality of existence in general as being deprived of the at once of eternity. That is this last part of this passage. So he writes, the, the, priva the privation, however, of this same at once from the totality of existence in general is time. For existence of which no part has this at once with another <coughs> is temporal existence. And if some existence alone should be posited and the, the at once should be divided from its totality with everything else removed, 
time must be understood. If you remove this alone, time is destroyed. Hence, this is time. So the idea here is that temporal items don't participate in God's eternity um, in respect of the whole of their existence, but only ever in respect of a part of it. And it will turn out to be an instantaneous part, whereas a test believes you can have, unlike Aristotle, you can have instantaneous parts. We won't go into that here. Um, so when one part of a temporal being's existence appears to be at once of eternity, the other parts don't. Um, so this is why he says that time is the privation of the advice of eternity, and the totality of existence in general. That is the idea that there are beings whose existence only adheres to the at once of eternity in respect of the part. Now, later in this paper, which I won't get to, I think he's thinking of um, successive items, items that exist in successive stages, like events and changes. And the idea is if you have a change, you never have the whole of the change in existence. You just have that part that's adhering to eternity. And that's what that's the crucial thing that gives us time. If, if only angels existed in God, you would not have time because their existence, the whole of it, precisely because it doesn't have any kind of spread, adheres to the once of eternity. So in effect, he comes back here to the Aristotelian conception that time and change are together, but that's the conclusion, as it were, of the explanation in terms of eternity. Now, I think I have time to just go through a little more of this theory, and if you give me time, can I take five more minutes? You can indeed, that makes just okay. five. Um, just to say a little more about this theory, and we can discuss some of the issues it raises those of you who are interested. First test proceeds to reject the suggestion that we understand the essence of time in terms of what he calls the positive differences that accompany this privation rather than in terms of the privation. And what he means by this is we shouldn't understand the essential nature of time by starting with the notions of past, present, and future. Instead, we should understand these notions in terms of the notions of adherence of existence or the lack thereof to be one at once of eternity. Now um, when he explains these notions, he makes a confusion, which is quite common in ancient authors, between the concepts of before and after and the concepts of past and future. They're not the same thing, uh, as McTaggart showed, but it's quite common for authors to confuse these. And I'm just going to go on to his little definition, and this is um, a little further down. Um, you can find the passage that says, I think, therefore, there it is. So he says, I think, therefore, before and after in time in respect of their true essence are said in terms of the link to the present instant. And this instant is being the adherence of some existence to the, uh, with the at once of eternity, from the totality of which existence the at once of eternity is divided. That is called before, over whose adherence with the at once of eternity falls the relation of anteriority in respect of the presential <laughs> adherence with the once of eternity. That is to say, helpfully, uh, the before is what has passed through adherence with the at once of eternity, and the future, notice how he's confusing these concepts, is what will pass what will pass through adherence. Okay, so the idea is what we mean by past is something that, that did adhere but doesn't anymore, and what is future is something that will adhere, and the present is what does adhere. Now, um, obviously, um, uh, a couple of things to note. First, he seems to take the present to be instantaneous. And I, I think he uh, subscribes to the view that past and future have no reality at all. Therefore, all there is in existence is an instant of the temporal reality, is the present instant and its contents. Um, the other thing to note is the definition circular, right? Has, will, is, present tense, adhering to the once of eternity. But, but um, Gross test realizes this. And he notes a little further down, um, he writes, nor let anyone object that I'm making known these different features of time, as it were, in terms of themselves. For it doesn't come to mind, or it does not easily come to mind, how else they could be known. So the student of nature makes them all known in terms of a link with change and changeable things, but someone knowing their true essence does so by links to the at once of eternity. Now, I just want to briefly say something about how this relates to time flow, and because I'm running out of time, I'm just going to talk through this and not read my paper. Um, the, so far, we've not mentioned the flow of time in this account, 
But it's clear that Gross test wants this picture to be viewed dynamically. He talks later in the text of the adherences. I think it's in one of the passages. It's the end of the Yeah, I see this somewhere in there. Um, plural of flowing being um, with the at once of eternity. So he's got this picture that what counts as adhering to the at once of eternity is con continuous change. That is the flow of time. This picture is meant to give you a model of the flow of time in terms, uh, and that of course is in Plato's definition of the moving image. This is how he's glossing this out. As for um, past and uh, futures reality, things are a little less clear on that in the text. Because um, one way you could read this picture is that the now, you could have this sort of picture of the now of eternity, it's like a, like a, a projection beam, like a, a film projector, right? And reality is the film being pulled through it, and when the frame gets the beam on it, it gets the special feature of being present. But notice that on that picture, the past and future frames are, are real, they're just not in the spotlight. So that's a view where you would have um, part of an objective now, flow of time, but also the reality of past and future. And that's the picture I don't think we should have. Um, and here's the reason why, and this is speculative, but Gross test has a theory of the nature of existence. Gross test theory of the nature of existence is to say that a creature exists is simply to, it, it, all that, what that means is that the creature depends on God. So it's a reductive account. Existence isn't some feature of the creature, it is the fact that the creature depends on God. And my hypothesis is that Gross test, the, the, the relation of adherence to the at once of eternity is essentially this relation of dependence. And what follows from that <coughs> is that, um, that we can't make sense on the gross testian theory of the past and future having any kind of existence because existence is to be in the spotlight, to adhere, and by definition they don't. And so I believe that he is also committed, and this picture is meant to give us the picture, that all that is real is the present and its contents. 